Namo tasa bhagavato arahato sama sambuddhasa. Namo tasa bhagavato arahato sama sambuddhasa. Namo tasa bhagavato arahato sama sambuddhasa. Homage to him, the worthy one, the fully enlightened one. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. Okay. So we're going to, what we're going to do first is we're going to go and take a look at uh, 135 tonight, Majima Nikai number 135. And this is the uh, Chula Kama Vibhanga Sutta, the shorter exposition of action. Bhante, do you want to cut your mic a little? Okay, okay. Um, so we'll start out by just taking a look at this sutta, 135 Chula Kama Vibhanga Sutta, the shorter exposition of action, found on 1053, the page in the Majjhima Nikaya. Thus I have heard on one occasion the Blessed One was living at Sawati in Jetis Grove. Anatha Pindikas Park. And then the Brahmin student Subha, Todia's son, went to the Blessed One and exchanged greetings with him. And when this courteous and amiable talk was finished, he sat down at one side and asked the Blessed One a question. Master Gotama, what is the cause and condition why human beings are seen to be inferior and superior? For people are seen to be short-lived and long-lived, sickly or healthy, ugly or beautiful, uninfluential or influential, poor or wealthy, low-born or high-born stupid or wise. What is the cause and condition, Master Gotama? why human beings are seen to be inferior and superior? This is the driving statement that comes now in the next part. Student, beings are owners of their actions, heirs of their actions. They originate from their actions, they are bound to their actions, have their actions as their refuge. It is action that distinguishes beings who are inferior and superior. And then he says, I do not understand in detail the meaning of Master Gotama's statement, which he spoke in brief without expounding the meaning in detail. And it would be good if Master Gotama would teach me the Dhamma so that I might understand it in detail, the meaning of Master Gotama's statement. Then listen and attend closely to what I shall say. Yes, sir, the Brahmin student Subha replied. And the Blessed One said this. Now he's going to start to explain uh, a set of what's been asked the most often. So if you wanna write them down before we start, he's going to ask about the um, short life, what leads to a short life, what leads to a long life. That's the first set. Then he's going to say, uh, you know, the next part is um, what leads to sickliness, and what leads to good health, okay? And then the next part will be, this is the way that leads to ugliness and then what leads uh, to beauty, uh, being beautiful. And then the next set is, this is the way leading to being uninfluential or becoming influential in a future lifetime. And then there's one for leading to wealth and, uh, and then there's one leading to being poor 
and leading to wealth, okay? And then one leading to either low birth or high birth. And then the last group is leading to stupidity or to wisdom. And if you're working with the sutta in the book, you can go to the paragraph in section 19, which summarizes each one of those um, in a summary of all those pieces. And then comes at the end of the sutta in section 20, you'll find the restatement of the first statement that he made about beings are owners of their actions. You'll hear this repeated, okay? So we'll just keep going here. First of all, when, do you guys understand when the Buddha met with his monks, what was happening in the monks would come in groups or the people would come in groups to listen to him talk. And when they showed up basically keeping the Buddha on their right side, which was the proper way, walking over and then announcing who you are or paying homage or you know, nodding your head to the Buddha, when you say where you come from, who you are, then passing him and sitting on his right side and listening and asking questions to him as he was explaining this. So that's the procedure they're talking about in the beginning of the setting, okay? So he starts to explain, here student, some man or woman kills living beings and is murderous bloody handed, given to blows and violence, merciless to living beings. Because of performing and undertaking such an action on the dissolution of the body after death, he reappears in a state of deprivation, in an unhappy destination, in perdition or even in hell. But if on the dissolution of the body after death, he does not reappear in a state of deprivation, in an unhappy destination, in perdition, in hell, but instead he comes back to the human state, then wherever he is reborn as a human, he is short-lived. This is the way that leads to a short life, namely one kills living beings, and is murderous, bloody handed, given to blows and violence, merciless to living beings. But then a student, some man or woman abandoning killing living beings abstains from killing living beings. And with a rod or weapon laid aside, they are gentle and they are kindly. And he abides compassionate to all living beings. And because of performing and undertaking such action on the dissolution of the body, after death, he reappears in a happy destination, even in a heavenly realm or world. But if on the dissolution of the body, after death, he does not reappear in the happy destination in a heavenly world, then instead he comes back to the human state and then wherever he is reborn, he is long lived. So this is the way that leads to long life, namely abandoning the killing of living beings and abstaining from killing living beings with a rod or weapon laid aside and being gentle and kindly instead, one abiding pat compassionate to all living beings. So he's explaining, he's using, if you can tell right away, what he's going to do in explaining this is he's going to follow the five precepts and use this as the beginning base for what it is that uh, he's explaining when he starts out doing this. And the karma basically is set up, karma is set up as a scale system in the universe, the way the Buddha is explaining it. So you have bad karma where there's been something harmful happened that builds up this bad karma can get very, very heavy. And on the other side of things, you have what you try to do that is good in this life. So if you're working on the good side, you can move the scale. You can move it so there's less of the bad and more of the good that is in your life. 
And you know, when we live our life, we find out this works very well to follow the precepts. We're much happier. And, and you go back to the Dwayta Vitaka Sutta number 19, you listen to him talking about that in the beginning, uh, figuring out how is it to not keep the precepts and to live on the side of evil and things and wrongdoing and life is not happy. And it's not easy to have people working with you and people don't respect you. And it's a very difficult time. But if you are good and you're living on the good side, people will support you and help you and work with you. And life is a lot happier. So it seems that this whole system of teaching the Buddha Dhamma is based on shifting the human being to let go of taking things personally, of keeping things in our mind that has happened in the past, letting that go and not dwelling on it. And then looking at the future, not worrying about the future because it's not here yet. That one you can knock off easily because it's not here and just move it off the stage. The two worst pieces are basically the past because most of your clinging, your craving, and your clinging is coming from your past. And what's happened to you has tended to uh, affect how you're going to live and make your decisions uh, about how you're going to react in similar ways from the past. If you look at your reactions, if you take a look at them and follow them for a little while, you begin to see that these reactions are all being affected by events from the past, okay? And you want to change this by letting them go and seeing if you can stay in the present time as it's moving along. Now, the idea of staying in the present moment is very nice. I laughed the other day because Eckhart Tolle actually came up with a statement about it's time to stay in the present time. And he was somebody who always was saying, stay in the present moment, okay? So he's actually picked up that it's pretty hard for people to accept I can stay in the moment, 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 moment. But it's much easier for me to say to you, can you stay in the present time and the way your behavior is just in the present time as you're doing one chore, one task in life at a time. That's pretty easy. And once you master that with anything that you're doing uh, and you're learning how to let go of things and letting go, remember that when you're looking at this whole thing and you want to change into the positive side, you cannot expect change to happen unless when you are letting go of something, you are always replacing it with a wholesome in place of it. And if nothing else is around, the first thing you do is you smile. You smile and replace it with that. And that trains your brain every time you're doing that. You are training your brain again. And so when we see the practice the Buddha was teaching us, when we're talking about right effort, we're seeing that he was very, very conscious about this and that he was always telling you to let go of the unwholesome and bring up a wholesome in place of it and keep that wholesome mind, the thought, the speech, the action, going and build on that similar things that feel the same way and are they are wholesome and they're going in the right direction and if we keep repeating that on the brain what we're doing is supporting the research that's happening today where the actual neural pathway in the brain that makes us react all the time okay is going to dry up eventually and just fall off. And the other one, the little tiny one that you start creating with your practice, if you do it all the time, nothing gets better in lockdown. Nothing changes at home. Nothing changes at work unless 
whenever we get frustrated and catch it and let go and relax our head, we would change it to a smile and forgiveness immediately. Forgive it. And why am I going to forgive it? I don't like what these people are doing and I don't want them to do it anymore. And we're in lockdown and it's really getting me angry. Well, you can choose to be like that if you want to, but what you're doing is you are supporting the problem and supporting the, bro the broken precept more and more and feeding it so that you keep reacting that way. You can never change unless when you let go of something, you put something in place of it. This is what the Buddha figures out with right effort. I hate to tell you, there's somebody at the door. <clears throat> so I'm gonna have to do, <laughs> okay, just a second. I'll... Next part now. Here, some man or woman abandoning the killing of living beings abstains from killing living beings with rod and weapon laid aside, gentle and kindly. He abides compassionate to all living beings. And because of performing and undertaking such actions, which is basically metta and karuna and forgiveness, working with that, on the dissolution of his body after death, he reappears in a happy destination and even in the heavenly world. But if on the dissolution of the body after death, he does not reappear in a happy destination, in a heavenly world, then instead he comes back to a human state. Wherever he is reborn, he is long lived. So basically saying that there is for actions that we do in this life, the reward basically happens in our lives in present time as we move along or in the future in rebirth as another being. It will affect us in the future. So this is the way, student, that leads to long life, the abandoning of the killing of living beings, et cetera, and so forth. And then some student, some man or woman given to injuring with the hand or with a clod, with a stick or with a knife, because of performing and undertaking such actions on the dissolution of their body after death, they reappear in a state of deprivation. But if instead he becomes, he comes back to the human state, then wherever he is reborn, he is sickly. And this is the way student that leads to a sickliness, namely one is given to enduring beings with a hand, with a clod, with a stick, or with a knife. And this is, this is a very difficult thing because um, the one about living short life and long life, I will tell you a story. Um, I've got to tell you a story. Uh, once there was a baby that was born and the baby was uh, very, 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 very small and it didn't survive. It only lived for three days. And when I was doing music in the church where I was, we had to do a funeral. This baby was so beautiful. It was a, a cesarean birth, cesarean C-section birth, and beautiful babies are born with no misshapen in the head at all when they're first born. And this baby was so beautiful and everyone was just so sad. We all felt so badly about it. And a man wrote me a letter once and said, how can you say that this baby did anything wrong in some previous life that this little baby should die? And the confusion here about is part of the confusion about karma is that this what's happening is happening to the being coming into the world, but it isn't the fault of that being. It has nothing to do with that. It comes from previous lifetimes in other lives that were done with other people in another time. It isn't even a family line that we can talk about. It's not like it's a genetic disease that's handed down. Um, it's not like that all the time. And so this is something we need to understand about uh, karma. What is karma, first of all? Let's stop for just a minute and make sure we understand the steps in the system so that you understand um, what's happening. 
So when, when we say karma, the place that gets confusing is in the 1960s, it was like there was even a show on TV and, and the, name, the girl's name was Karma, or that was the name of the show. I can't remember what it was. But the, the problem here is you're making karma every day and you have control over what you decide to do with your life to follow the precepts or not follow the precepts. The word karma itself or kama, the, the uh, you know, Theravada say the, the kama in Pali and the karma is Sanskrit. You hear me say karma because people really understand what that is because that became the word in the hippie world and the 60s, 1960s and 70s. So anyway, um, the karma itself, the word, it just means action. It means mental action, verbal action, physical action. So you're creating karma all the time, every day, from the time you get up and you go through your day. So you can't walk around saying my whole life is a rough time because it's just my karma. Well, that's not the way it is. If you want to say something's affecting you from another lifetime, actually, it's Kamapala, the, the, the fruit of the action. So the four words, there's actually, there were four words involved in the system originally. The first word is Chaitana, Chaitana, C-E-T-A-N-A. And the Chaitana meant the intention of the action that I am going to take. My action can be the way I speak or the way I act or, um, you know, uh, think, plan. And my intention to do something physically comes from this chaitanya. So the intention, the degree of the intention in the mind of the person before they do the action is going to determine uh, it's directly proportionate to what's going to happen as the result of that action. So the first thought is the intention. The second piece is the action itself, karma. The third piece is called vipaka, V-I-P-A-K-A. -A. And vipaka, vipaka actually meant the ripening of the action. So the intention, the action, the ripening period of that action. You know, you see these movies where somebody will kill somebody and try to hide the body and then try to forget they didn't, you know, walk away and nobody's going to catch me because I, I murdered the person, okay, in the story. But the problem with that is the, that this gets inside what the person did in their action starts to eat them alive and all the hindrances come down on them because of this horrible thing they did. Okay, and they can not tell anybody. And Alfred Hitchcock used to write these stories in the 1960s and early 70s about how the, the ghost comes back or the person gets so upset, they can't sleep, they can't eat. They dream about the person coming back to get them and tell everyone somehow where are the axes that the person was killed with or something. See, all of this happens from the action. And then it gets inside and then this is the ripening period. And then in the end, the person, the final Kamapala, that's, that's coming out, the fruit of the action the person did, the fruit of the action is what happens later. So the fruit in this case, in the story is coming out in the person's lifetime. Now you might do something where, let's put it in a different framework so you understand that this is working day to day. In the morning, you get really upset with your mother or your, your uh, wife or husband, and you say something really bad in the morning and you go off to work and that, ripens all day <laughs> they might tell someone about it or they're very upset about it and it ripens in you and you start feeling bad and working slower at work and everything can't go well because you are doing this to yourself by not cleaning up this thing and apologizing or letting it go into the past and just bringing flowers to the person or giving them tea and forgiving them and then trying to go forward again you see 
So when we do things, if we take them inside, then the, the churns around and gets inside and develops inside, that's your ripening period. That's your vipaka. And the kamapala is what comes out the other end. In this lifetime, this can come out or it can flow when you die and you haven't taken care of it. You haven't, I've known people who were going to die and worked with them in the United States several times. And, you know, you're working with the people at the time that they're going to die. And many people will call everyone in they knew and ask them to forgive them for things that they had done and clean the slate before they leave. Other people won't bother doing that. And when they don't bother doing that at all, they've done nothing to rebalance this at all. And then that bad karma is very heavy of what happened and they carry it and they're thinking of it when they're dying and they're carrying that problem with them out of this world. And then that energy that leaves can come back into a future lifetime for that person. Future lifetime is really tricky because you can come back as a man or a woman. So men, what I like to say to men is don't mistreat women. You might end up coming back as a woman and have to go through what we go through. And you're not going to like that at all. You see, there was one um, wonderful movie about that called Switch. That was the story of a man who wanted to get to heaven and then he couldn't get in because of what he had done. And then they decided to send him back to earth to try one more time to just find one person who said on earth that they loved the person. And then they would let him come in heaven when he died that time. That's what the story was based on. It's very, very interesting what happened. Anyway, so this person leads to a long life. And the next person, this is the way uh, what happens is if a man or woman is injuring people with a hand, meaning slapping a person or a clod is a piece of uh, mud or earth, you know, that has turned hard or hitting him with a stick or a knife because of performing such kinds of actions, he reappears in a state of deprivation and may go into perdition or even help, but in the dissolution of the body after death, uh, instead he would come back to the human state. If that were true, uh, whenever he's reborn, he comes back, he is sickly, okay? And this is the way that leads to sickliness. And then it goes on to go through the same thing again and basically saying that, that if the person uh, is performing actions um, such as, I'm sorry, some man or woman is not given to injuring the beings with the clod or stick, then they will come back in good health and they will not. But the person who goes around hurting people um, is going to have a huge problem when they leave and go into another realm. So these realms we like to say, well, they're very hypothetical. And when we talk about Dr. Ambikar, I read the, uh, the Buddha and his Dhamma several times. I realized that Dr. Ambikar did not teach this particular sutta. It's a very interesting thing. I couldn't find it. Somebody who studies should tell me if it's really there, but I couldn't find it. And if he didn't teach this this way, then why wouldn't he is because at that time, the people who were very uneducated in that group would not be able to handle these kinds of explanations for things. But now today, I think you can because of being more educated and open-minded, looking at what the Buddha is telling you about how this is working. It's a basic lesson, all of karma you hear it in every religion, every country, every language. What goes around comes around. What you do unto others, they will do unto you. So you don't do this, this won't happen. If you do this, this will happen. So this is not a new uh, concept that is only Buddhist when you were talking about karma. Okay, this way, um, the student or woman 
who is angry and irritated with an irritable character, even when they are criticized a little, the person is offended, becomes angry and hostile and resentful and play, displays anger and hate and bitterness. And because of performing and undertaking such actions, um, they will be reappear in a state of deprivation. And this is the way that leads to a person coming back whenever they are reborn in a human state. If they come back, they're born into ugliness or one is uh, who is angry and irritable in character and um, resentful and displays anger and that way displays anger and hatred and bitterness. So this is a lesson to be kind to people and not to be patient. I mean, to be patient and not angry and bitter and um, resentful and these types of things, to be patient and more accepting. So the next one is the woman who is not, the man or woman who is not angry or irritable in character. Not, and when criticized a lot, he's not offended, does not become angry hostile and resentful, does not display anger, hate, and bitterness. And because of performing and undertaking such actions, he reappears in a happy destination. But instead, if he comes back in the human state again, and you notice they keep saying, but if he comes back as a human state, they're trying to talk about this when you, 135 is quite a way through the book, and they're already talking to you about the attainments and letting you know that you can end up going to different types of realms. And he's talking about uh, the many, many different kinds of realms. I always tell people to ask David to talk to you about the realms at Damasuka. He likes to talk about all the realms, okay? Um, but what I'm trying to deal with here is all of this whole program of karma comes back to the guidance we are given uh, pertaining to the five precepts and helping to guide us through that. But when you have an attainment, you are going to face Sotapanna, only have to come back seven times as a human being before you reach Nibbana. That you have, you can have set up seven more lifetimes before that is likely to happen. If it's so to, if it's Sakadagami, it's only one more human lifetime and you don't have to come back uh, after one more uh, you one more lifetime. And that lifetime, it's funny, that lifetime doesn't have to end up being human. It could end up being uh, some other place, some other planet, not even on this planet that you go through. Because he's talking about something that's in the universe, not something that's only earthbound, covered by the firmament and locked in on earth. That's another thing about the teachings of the Buddha. So you see, if the person is not of an angry, irritable na uh, nature, uh, and they do not have bitterness and hatred, they can reappear in a happy destination and come back and they will be beautiful. Namely, one is not of an angry or irritable nature. They'll come back and they're, they're beautiful. And you see all different variations of this in life. And you say, how did this happen? And this is the way the Buddha was explaining it and teaching it in this system. In section 12, the man or the woman is not envious. One who is not, who does not envy, resent, and begrudge the gains and honors, respect, reverence, salutation, and veneration that is received by others. The person who is not jealous of other people being successful. Before, because of becoming, uh, performing and undertaking their actions without these problems, he reappears in a happy destination. But if he comes back as a human being, wherever he's reborn, he is influential. So this is how a person is influential or a person is not influential. In 13, you're looking at 
a man or a woman who does not give food or drink or clothing, carriages, garlands, scents and unguents, beds and dwellings and lamps to recluses or Brahmins. And because of not of performing and undertaking such actions, they reappear in a state of deprivation. But if they come back as a human being, they're coming back poor. So this is another thing we find a comparison. We, we hear it over in Christianity, the more, more blessed to give than to receive. And when you give things to people, you will find out that you don't need anything coming back and things will come back that are vital for you to continue to live life. And when I was uh, in the, um, went through an experience uh, one year, when my husband was very ill and he had a very bad back injury, but we kept going to church. We kept working with people. We were working on projects for different uh, people in different areas in the surrounding countryside where I was. And um, we never stopped doing that, even though he was sick and he was bedridden and he couldn't work, we kept going. And we, we really held our eye on the fact that if we believed that what we put out we would be able to get back enough to survive through that time. And we did. And we never ran out of food. It was a very funny experience because I think, you know, there's not enough food in the cabinet for seven people to have the meals for five days in a week. At the end of the week, there would be more things in there than we started the prior week. Now, I think some of our supporting sisters and so forth were coming in, putting things in the house I didn't know about. But the thing was, it was happening. It was coming around. So when you put out to help people, it comes back to you. And that's real important to understand how that works in the universe. The student uh, who, the man or woman who gives food and helps the recluses, uh, they this way leads to them coming back and, and having wealth in the future life. That's in 14. In 15, the student, some man or woman is obstinate and arrogant. And if he does not pay homage to one who should receive homage, does not rise up for one whose presence he should rise up for, does not offer a seat to one who deserves a seat, does not make way for one who, whom he should make way for, and does not honor, respect, revere, and venerate those who should be honored and respected and revered, then he reappears in a state of deprivation, or if he comes back in a human state, he comes back lowborn. He's not learned to pay respect, and so he will not have respect and support in another lifetime. So to me, this whole system is what we would talk about on the farm while we were working. You know what goes around comes around. So if you didn't do your chores, then you don't get to have lunch, that sort of thing. If you're not working, we don't feed you. This is, this is kind of where I was at the time. And there was once a man who was so determined that he was gonna work in the depression period in Lynchburg, Virginia, there was a, um, a fire, they call it a, um, a furnace where they m m heated the furnace for work they did with making pipes and things like that it had to do with Griffin Pipe Company in Lynchburg, Virginia. And it's a famous story. He was just a person with four kids and he and his wife, they lost everything and their depression, but he kept coming to the fire uh, tower every day and shoveling coal in with the other men. He just showed up with a shovel and started shoveling coal into the furnace to keep this thing operating. And the foreman didn't know who he was. And the first time they gave out checks, there wasn't one for him. The second time they gave out checks uh, to people, they gave out the pay to people. Um, he noticed this man wasn't, he didn't get anything. And then he made sure he got something the next month and finally they hired him. And then eventually this man worked his way up in the company until he was vice president of Griffin Pipe. And when the company uh, downsized and closed, I, I think it closed, but it may have reopened now, um, that company, he was one of the top people 
as a VP for that company next to the CEO because he had done that and put out. And he didn't go home and cry about not having a job. He didn't give up. He didn't uh, just go and work in a field if that's all he could do. He found something that he could physically do and he did it. And he kept working really hard and it came back to him that people noticed it and it was a payback. Okay, so the second, now here a man or a woman is obstinate and arrogant, don't pay homage. And there that person comes back in low birth situation in another lifetime. And this is how it happens that this comes by. And then in another, the other one is not obstinate, not arrogant, pays homage to those who should receive homage and rises up for those whose presence they should rise up and offers a seat for those who deserve a seat, makes way for one for whom uh, he should make way and honors and respects and reveres and venerates those who should be honored and respected and revered and venerated. Because of performing and undertaking such action, he reappears in a happy destination. But if he comes back in a human state again, this uh, he would come back, he would be reborn as a highborn position, as a highborn. And this is the way, student, that leads to high birth. And namely, one is not obstinate or arrogant and neglects but honors and respects, reveres and venerates one, who, those who should be honored. And so here students, some man or woman does not visit a recluse or a Brahmin and ask, venerable sir, what is wholesome? What is unwholesome? What is blamable? What is blameless? What should be cultivated? What should not be cultivated? What kind of action will lead to my harm and suffering for a long time? What kind of action will lead to my welfare and happiness for a long time? Because of performing and undertaking such action, this one will be reborn, reappears in a state of deprivation. But if he does not, if he does not visit a recluse or teacher, so this is an, the idea that if you in your lifetime, the thing about being human, people miss sometimes, and sometimes I speak to Buddhists who never heard this. We're actually really lucky, you know, and we may not seem that way with what we're going through worldwide at this time, but as human beings, we are fortunate to be born in a human state. We have the ability to compute and to study and to do all the things in 95 that he, he asks you to do in, in uh, number 95. I always go back to that and I say, you know, we are all capable of doing all these things um, in, when we are learning the Dhamma because we're a human being. And, we, and that's, that's really how it works. We can put faith into it. And then we can, um, we can, uh, where is it? Give me a minute. Here we go. When you look back at 95, it talks about how do you get the truth? And you think about a horse or a cow trying to figure this out. It doesn't work out so well. Okay, but if you think about a human being, we have the potential to put faith in something, we put faith in the Buddha that he found something. That's the faith we're talking about. And faith that he found a practice that we can repeat. And then we have to visit him and then paying respect to him and then giving ear, meaning listening purely to the Dhamma without anything else going on in your head. Just listen to the Dhamma, try to follow it precisely as you hear it and then practice it. That's giving ear, hearing the Dhamma. When you give ear, hearing it means, do you really let it in? Memorizing the teachings can be as little as memorizing five aggregates, the four foundations, 
the four kinds of spiritual power, the 37 requisites of enlightenment, three kinds of feeling, the four noble truths. That's memorizing. When you go that far, it's memorizing. Okay. Examining the meaning of what we say to you when we are teaching you this Dhamma. Reflective acceptance of the teaching, testing it and, and uh, testing it and um, experiencing it in life is reflecting on the acceptance of it. If you accept it, how is it working? Zeal is enthusiasm. That's what it means. Enthusiasm is most helpful. Um, and then when your enthusiasm starts to come up, because when you practice using TWIM, people get excited because they, they can feel a difference right away. And when they start actually letting go and relaxing and smiling, and they keep doing that, let go, relax, smile, come back. When something pulls you away at work, when you're working and you do that, you have instant experience of relief. The application of your will, you have the chance to apply your will and sit and do your practice. Scrutinizing, when you're in the practice itself, scrutinizing is most helpful to striving and scrutinizing what you're seeing in your practice, considering it, applying it, testing everything that we give to you, not accepting it because I say it or Bhante says it or anybody else but because it works. So this is an operable teaching, operable. And then striving mean, means going down the path and striving is the same thing as applying right effort over and over and over and over again, 100,000 times till your mind just does it automatically, recognizes the tension that starts to happen, releases it, relax the head, Smile and come back to whatever you're doing at work, to whatever you were doing when somebody interrupted you. No matter how grumpy they are, you can't control how grumpy somebody is in, in lockdown. You can't control other people, but if you smile, if you bring light into the situation, you're in control of yourself and your energy and your energy goes out. I've explained before the auric energy and the, it goes out and the, the teachings of the chakras are the same in balancing yourself in your chakras, okay? And when you are working with your energies, that's flowing out of you and that, and that affects people around you, okay? And you make their day by smiling and you make it by doing things they don't ask you to do, doing extra things. So then we get to the part about um, the woman or the man gives food and lamps and recluses to the Brahmins, performs and undertakes these actions. And when they do that, they get to a happy destination. But if they don't help when people need food and when they need light and when they need water, the basics, then it leads to um, it leads to a problem of not having food and it, it takes them to a place, uh, I'm sorry, I get messed up here, leads them to a place where they are poor and leads them to a place where they're wealthy. It leads them to a place where they are in low birth, takes them to a place in high birth. Okay, here we are, the famous one that we always talk to you guys about. Listen to this one. That's where the questions are, these questions. If you ask questions and you die, you come back with wisdom and you are smart in the next life. Wherever you're born, you come back. So ask questions, ask questions, ask questions. Because the way to knowledge is through asking the question and finding out. And there is no such a thing, no such a thing as a dumb question. You, you hear a word when I'm teaching, there should be a question afterwards. What does that word mean? That should be there. It should be happening. We have trouble with getting people to ask questions. If you don't understand a word or a part that we're talking about, just ask and we'll try again to explain. Okay. Um, if you don't ask questions, you come back stupid. It's right here. 
If instead he comes to a human state and he is reborn stupid, this is the way for the student to leading to stupidity is that he didn't ask these questions that we mentioned, okay? If he does ask those questions and he asks all the questions of what is wholesome, what is unwholesome, what is blamable, what is blameless, and he keeps picking at it, you end up like me or you have an encyclopedia in your head where you, you're still, I'm still putting pieces together. I'm still listening to suttas that I've heard a hundred times. And I listen to it or I teach it to you and there's another epiphany in a, a little epiphany that happens in there that reveals something I didn't get before. Why, why does it work that way? Because you're always, once you dive into this, you're moving along and your brain, whether you like it or not, is gonna keep evolving and even if you stop meditation for a few weeks and go on a canoe trip and come back and start again, you'll find out you start a little bit further, a little bit deeper, because something is released inside of you, like you put the boat in the river, it's going to float down to the ocean. So it starts moving. Something inside us is moving once we get into this. What kind of action will lead to my welfare and happiness for a long time? And because of performing and undertaking the actions we talked about, asking those questions, the person comes back with wisdom. And then the, uh, that's the, the last one. So you have looked at the way that leads to the short life and the way that leads to the long life. You've heard the one for sickliness or for good health. You have heard the one for ugliness and for beauty. You have heard the one for uninfluential, you come back uninfluential or an influential person. And then you've heard of poverty and you've heard of wealth and you've heard about low birth and high birth and stupidity or wisdom. One thing about low birth and high birth is the Buddha really understood the uh, human brain and that if a person is of low birth has no bearing at all on the potential for that person to learn the Dhamma, to learn the practice in very, very simple ways. Um, you know, there are very, a number of stories about, um, Bhante, can you tell me what the one is, uh, Bhante Dhamma Gavesi, do you remember the one about the cloth where the one brother he couldn't learn, but the other brother he could learn. And then they gave him the cloth and he kept- uh, remember the exact uh, kind of the uh, text of it. They were. He uh, told them to take. But, a, uh, he is asked to uh, swipe the cloth, the white cloth, right. and right. Uh, uh, he understands impermanence by the uh, the right. uh, after the cloth becomes dirty. That he was supposed. I, uh, oh, yeah, I think he's holding the cloth and he's just rubbing it like this, and he's doing permanent and impermanent, and permanent and impermanent. And he's learn. He's learning the Anicca very, very clearly. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's what, and there was, a, there's another lesson. I can't, I remember there's like four of them. Four was asked to uh, memorize four uh, uh, lines, but he was not able to do that also. Uh, so there is a, another sutta where Buddha says that it is better that you uh, learn four lines and practice. But then uh, memorize a lot. But that was it. So right. So, so the one brother couldn't pronounce it clearly, the Pali, and the other brother was really good at it. Mm -hmm. that, that was the one you're talking about. Mm -hmm. And so the Buddha said, "You take these four lines." I remember when I was traveling with Bonte, I I had some accidents, and um, I insisted, you know, that the doctors were correct. I would never be able to memorize anything ever again. And um, I swallowed that and believed them instead of trying. And when we were driving thousands of miles around the United States, um, he would force me to memorize and repeat and repeat and repeat. And so that's how I learned the 37 requisites of enlightenment, you know, and then I had to explain them for the first year we did it in English. And the second year I was driving for him, we did the whole thing in Pali. So I knew the names of, it, of everything in Pali and his position on Pali. I will explain this to you because you're here in India you, you, and in Asia, you um, 
you learn a lot of this, the Pali, and you learn about Buddha, the Buddhist teaching through Pali. But the argument with my teacher was very simple. In China, you go to the temple and everything's done in Chinese. In Burma, it's all done in Burmese. In Thailand, it's absolutely done in Thai, in the temples. And then they do chant in the Pali, but for the lay people, it is all taught in classes uh, without being forced to learn Pali. Um, they are doing everything in the language of their country. And the this position was, why would the United States be any different? Why can't we learn the, the Dhamma completely by learning it in English, you see? So first learning um, the, uh, those pieces, you know, the four noble truths, the three characteristics, and then three kinds of feelings, six sense doors, and then the 37 requisites of enlightenment, and then the 12 pieces of dependent origination, and then how do things work with, an in, with events, with the seven links that we teach you to look at, so you can watch how things actually work, okay? And first we did it in English, and then the next year we learned it in Pali. So it's determination and repetition. And I did memorize and I could memorize. It just takes me a lot longer to do that than it would for the normal person, but it's possible. So that was fun. Um, so then we get to the end of the sutta, we're talking being our beings, our owners of their actions, um, heirs of their actions, they originate from their actions. They are bound to their actions, having their actions as their refuge. And it is action that distinguishes beings as inferior or superior. Let's go back to that first one, inferior or superior. And at the end, what is said, the Brahmin student Subha, Todia's son, said to the Blessed One, Magnificent Master Gotama, Magnificent Master Gotama has made the Dhamma clear in many ways, as though he were turning upright what has been overturned, revealing what was hidden, showing the way to one that was lost, or holding up a lamp in the dark for those with eyesight to see forms. I go to Master Gotama for refuge and to the Dhamma and to the Sangha of the bhikkhus and bhikkhunis. Let Master Gotama remember me as a lay follower who has gone to him for refuge for life. And so this is what happened in this series. So one of the questions that came up before we started, I asked, people if they had questions about karma. And one question was, how is it that meditation can wipe away other karma? That's a good question. Okay, it's a good question. I think we, when we're working with meditation, we have to look at what we're, what kind of meditation. And one of the things I think if I could say something irritated me, the only thing I can think it irritates me is to hear people say, all meditation is the same. And that's just not true. And the Buddha pointed this out when Ananda came to him and said, is there good meditation and bad meditation? And the Buddha said to him, it's good meditation if it helps you go down the path to reach Nibbana. And then he said, it's bad meditation if it doesn't take you down the path to Nibbana. Now he's talking in terms of this happening in shorter periods of time than we usually hear people talking about. And this is where the whole teaching becomes operative in life and usable in life and applicable in life and very useful, very pragmatic for life, or it isn't. And we learn about the brain, we learn the whole teaching is about moving something from unwholesome things that are hurting you and pulling you down and learning the teaching and how to apply an impersonal perspective and let go of taking everything so seriously in life and, and stop fighting with hindrances. Just allow them to come, be there, go away because of anicca, 
because Anicca is saying everything is impermanent. So whatever arises, passes away, letting it happen, okay? And uh, the dukkha understanding structurally, how does it actually work? And we know that the Buddha told us that he didn't teach without a basis or without knowledge or with something that was antidotal. He taught something that had a very clear basis and it had a clear set of knowledge to learn by seeing it. That's really important. I may have mentioned to you that someone called me from Canada once and said, what are you talking about knowledge and vision? Why do you talk about that? We talk about knowledge and wisdom. And I, it's because they weren't studying through the text. They were studying through teachers talking to them and trying to follow what they were saying, but they weren't going directly through the text. And if we look at the text, we begin to understand knowledge and wisdom comes from the knowledge and vision you had experienced in the meditation as observing and observing how it works in life that turns into knowledge and wisdom. So knowledge and vision was a method of teaching. You had to be practicing a meditation where you could see how things were operating. What is the origination? What is the disappearance? What is the gratification where I get involved in it? Where is the danger of this, whatever comes up? And then what is the escape? So in that sutta that I just quoted is 148, we hear that there was an escape. There is an antidote, he says, there is a basis, a set of knowledge, and an, I found the antidote. That's what he says. And so that's what made me determined to stick with this and to keep practicing until I could understand what is he talking about? There's really a, a escape from this. And pretty soon, if you're practicing the way that we're showing you, you will come to understand nothing has been happening to you. You think that all this weight of everything is upon your head, pressing you down in life and pushing you into depression and controlling you. And it's the fault of something out here. When the answer was, you don't need to be the subjective and be watching the object, but in the actual Buddhism, the subject becomes the object internally. You go into the mind. So we are not just looking out. We are looking in for the answer. And the answer is how is the origination happening of the suffering? How does it come and go like that, Sunitra, okay? What is the gratification? That's the lust and greed or the hatred and aversion. And it's the craving and the clinging. Okay. And then we're saying, what's the danger of it? The danger of it is if you continue to indulge in something that is the craving and clinging. If you look at the craving, I don't like something. And all the stories about why you don't look like something why do you have that opinion? Why is that happening? The reason it's happening is because you're taking the past and what happened before and applying it to here. This is the problem in every peace conference every country has in the world. They are stuck. They were stuck. And this is why they don't like the most recent, some of the people that have been working in the world because they say, hey, let go of all that stuff the way you've been doing it. Let's look at it a different way. Let's look at it today and see if there is something we can do that's different and get unstuck with, you know, if we do this, they're going to do this and they're going to do this because they've always have. Let's all agree we're going to try something for the human beings on the planet as a whole. How many beings live in this country? How many, not how many Indians. I mean, I want there to still be Indians, okay? But, and I want there to still be French and Spanish and so, but what would happen if you sat there one day, just contemplate this for a minute. What if we just counted people everywhere, irregardless of color, creed, religion, labels, and said, how many people are here? And how can we help the planet, but help ourselves all to survive? 
we would be able to do that if we would just stop and look at it that way. So your practice that we're teaching you is basically the original definition for right effort, samawayama in the Eightfold Path. And the reason that was important, if we look at it, we can understand. I want you to understand what happened to this when it got lost, because it took me a while to figure it out. If you go to 77, uh, Sutta number 77, go to page 636 in 77. At the bottom, you see four kinds of right striving. And right striving and right effort are exactly the same wording in the text, Pali or English. So when we look at this, we can understand if you were not taught some of the key basic pieces of knowledge about the Dhamma, that you can mistake this as meaning that you have to work very, very hard to have right effort operate for you. But watch this. If I say here, that we'll say a student awakens enthusiasm for the non-arising of unarisen, evil, unwholesome states. He makes effort, arouses energy, exerts his mind and strives. Now, this is the part where you simply recognize when there's an unwholesome mind state in your mind. So initially when you are practicing with TWIM or the six R's, the Tranquil Wisdom Insight Meditation, okay. Initially when you're practicing, you do make an effort and arouse energy and exert your mind and you strive to be aware and conscious of when anything changes in your mind about tension and tightness coming up and that's the unwholesome mind state that's what this actually means it actually doesn't the problem i think the most problematic word in losing the meaning for right effort was the word effort and it doesn't always mean that you have to have hard labor and work and stress and strain and exhaustion and persevere and all that. Of course you persevere, but that is the conventional definition for effort, the conventional meaning of arousing energy, the conventional meaning for exerting your mind and striving, conventionally striving to do anything in life, to be a tennis player, to be a long distance biker, to be a, you know, a, a CEO of a company, a teacher, an inventor, a politician, anything you wanna be in the whole world to be successful, you must put effort into what you're doing to learn about that occupation put energy into performing whatever that occupation requires, exert your mind and continue striving all the time to become the best at it, don't you? But that's conventional. Where in the Eightfold Path, right effort and right uh, observation, mindfulness and where uh, concentration or collectedness of mind sit, they appear as six, seven, and eight in the eight pieces of the Eightfold Path. And when you are using those pieces, it's all about practice, isn't it? All those three pieces are talking about is practice. Whether you are doing straight observation on an object or you are practicing this way, it's always been about practice six, seven, and eight. So we're calling, what we do is we are calling the right effort, re refining the meaning to the ultimate practice, the ultimate reality, seeing the ultimate reality 
and it has to do with observation. So right effort is observation, harmonious observation that isn't upsetting, doesn't cause any excess energy. Very clear, pointed, but not tightly, just looking and what's happening in your meditation when you're practicing. The second one after the effort was mindfulness, right? Mindfulness. No one can really tell you about what mindfulness is. It seems to be a big dilemma. And it always boils down to paying attention or paying attention very tightly on something and paying attention to this and attention to that, okay? But instead of that kind of attention, the... Um, the, the right effort is changed, I'm sorry, the right mindfulness is changed to observation and the right effort is changed to harmonious practice. Why? Because no matter how you cut it, if you go to the text themselves, wherever you go, you're going to find these four steps involved. The first one is to pay attention to the unarisen, evil, unwholesome state. So you're watching, watching out for unwholesome states. The next one says, he awakens enthusiasm for the abandoning of this unwholesome state that came up. So what are your steps in your practice? Recognize the unwholesome mind state. Release the unwholesome mind state. Okay. And we say, relax the head for any leftover tension that's there. Release the unwholesome mindset and relax the head. Okay. And then he awakens enthusiasm for the arising of unarisen wholesome states. So we tell you to smile. It's real easy. Smile. And a smile. This is another thing I was went worried about this week. I had students coming to me again with the proverbial problem <laughs> with a smile. And there shouldn't be any problem with this smile, okay? But what it is about these muscles right here on the two endpoints of your lips here, you know, here and here, are directly connected to your brain up here and will relax the two hemispheres of your brain to separate slightly by tightening these muscles slightly. So if you want to smile with a straight line, fine. Instead of smiling like that with your mouth closed, okay, when you're practicing, you don't have to sit there through the sitting like this. Nobody said show your teeth. Close your mouth, smile gently, or somehow figure out how you're going to tighten these two muscles right here. One here, one here. If you tighten that, okay, this immediately separates and the endorphins start to flow and you feel light and very happy. And this happiness that you feel while you are practicing in meditation is wholesome. It is a very wholesome feeling. He awakens enthusiasm for the continuation, the non-disappearance, the strengthening increase and fulfillment by development of arisen wholesome states. That just means in your life when you smile, you know, something comes up and it bothers you. How can I get it across to you? Never mind. I mean, why hold on to something that is, is bothering you and is hurting you or making you angry? Why grab a hold of it like burning coals and saying, ow, ow, I'm so mad you're yelling at me. Why? Just let go of it. So how can we talk about that? I came up with basically saying, never mind, let it go, relax, smile, come back. That's it. That's the whole practice. What are you doing when you are doing this cycle? You are, it's like a cycle of, of wash going through where the kids came home and their clothes were white and now they're all muddy because we're playing in the mud. So you have to take the clothes, put them in the washing machine, put the right kind of bleach and the right kind of soap and go through a cycle and clean them until they come out again. That's what you're doing with your mind. It's a washing system 
It is a purification system and it is also a retraining system. Because if you keep using this cycle over and over again with your brain, eventually somebody does something and you just let it go, relax, smile, come back. It's going to be over in a minute. You should all agree with me. It's not going to stay here. It's going to be over and change into something else very quickly. So whenever this feeling arises of tension and tightness, don't let it be so surprising to you. Just okay and let it go. You know, people said they were going to be here at two o'clock or three o'clock today and they marched in at just as we started class tonight. Okay, fine. <laughs> That's okay. You know, it's the same thing with uh, anything that happens during the day that's off sides. We say it's not on the playing field. I didn't plan it. I planned my day and it was going to be like this. It was going to happen like this. I was going to do this. This is how it was going to work. And it didn't happen that way. Okay. So erase the picture for today. Leave a white canvas on the wall and tomorrow create another day and use happy colors and let things go. Now, what am I doing karmically? What am I doing when I do this? Well, if we go back into, I think it's 19, um, at the end of 19, we can see this wonderful statement that he tells the monks, um, when is it, when is, whatever a monk frequently thinks and ponders on that will become the inclination of his mind. Ah, which scientific laboratory was the Buddha? This is a $60,000 question, okay? Which neuroscience laboratory was the Buddha working in that he figured this out 2,600 years ago and we didn't figure it out until 1990 in modern times. And finally in 1990, they started figuring out that what you think constantly determines how you're going to, um, that will be the inclination, the direction your mind will go towards thought. So you get to train your mind. So there you are. Now I showed you a practice that purified your mind and it's retraining your mind. So this is how and why, this is why this practice is cleaning up old karma because the scale, the more kindness, the more loving kindness, the more forgiving you are, the more that you help other people. There's all these different guidelines when we say the, um, the paramis that we should, um, the paramita, paramita sutta and then the list of paramis, 10 paramis we work on in order to clear away the karma, right? And those are having to do with forgiveness and loving kindness and being obedient and being organized in life so that you are helping others, not just yourself. You are looking at life impersonally, not taking everything personally. So it's easier not to get mad if you don't take anything personally. So if Umar decides to yell at me, okay, you decide to yell at me. If you yell at me, I don't have to take it personally. I know it's going to start and then it happens and then it goes away. It's okay. Yeah. So this is the way that you see how things arise and they are caught with us. Now, when you're looking at karma, the best guidance system you have is the story that I showed you, I can go back and do this just real quick. If you haven't seen this diagram um, to go to the share and we go to the whiteboard. Okay, and we just, we take a color and um, we, uh, we just draw a line like from here across and we say, okay, the birth is here and the death is here. And here you are, you're right here. On the, on the string, if I had a string and I had it pulled out, that's where you are. 
And everything in your life is moving in this direction, right? It's moving in this direction. Everybody's life is moving in that direction. Everybody's the same on the whole earth. So the name of this is the past. And the name of this is the future. Why? Because it's in front of you and the past is behind you. And then this one down here that has got to be bright pink is the present. This is the present. Now, this present time, present time, okay? This present time is moving all the time. It's always moving along this path. Can you stay for a few days? Just try it. Whatever you're doing, stay right there in that. And don't think about anything else. You have pain in your body, let it go, relax, smile. The more you let, let it go, relax, smile and come back, the less pain you have in your body. If you occupy your mind on something else, it hurts much less. If, it, if you, um, you strike yourself, well, the way I used to tell my students about this was if you um, sit at a table and you get a small book and put it on the table and you get a, a, a clock that has seconds on it. it. The second hand is going around. And the first thing you do is you sit down, okay? And what you do is you slap your hand and you concentrate on the pain on your hand, concentrate on it. And you watch that second hand. And when the pain fades away, you mark down the time. Okay. After that, you go do something, go, go outside, pick up the mail, come back in the house, or you just do something, go up and down the stairs a few times. And then you come back about 10 minutes later, you sit down at the table to do the same thing again, but you're going to do it differently this time. So this time you're going to hold your hand up and you're going to smack your hand. But when the pain starts in your hand, when you smack it, you're going to immediately start reading in this book, but you watch the clock, you smack it and start reading in the book, whatever the book is or the newspaper, just start reading it. The moment that paint's gone, I want you to look at the clock and it's going to be a shorter time. So here's the question. What actually changed? What is it that changed? Okay. What changed was that you occupied your mind on something other than the pain. This is how come people are able to have be injured in battle and they walk miles to get back to camp or they walk a long way and are able to keep moving even though they're injured and with a whole lot of pain. How can they get there unless they're concentrating on something other than the pain? If you, want, if you ever hurt yourself and you have an accident, if you're in a car, if you don't move and you, you are able to just relax, the pain goes out of you and you can function much better. And all of this is real. And all of this people are claiming uh, credit for discovering from 1990 forward about how this mind and body relationship is, but we had it all the time. We had it all the time. So when you're working and doing good things and you are helping people and you are practicing this cycle all the time, the reason that the uh, karma uh, is being burned off with meditation is because the whole process is a purification and retraining system for your mind. So you're creating another destiny another line in you have fate but you have destiny and you can change the way the destiny gets from here to here you can do that you might not be able to change fate maybe but you can change the destiny of a person can make their own destiny as far as how they decide to do things decide to behave decide to work with people so that's the effect of the whole thing so we should stop and you should ask questions. Do you have any other questions? Am I helping you enough to see how that's working? Anybody? Yeah. Questions? Oh, yes, I do. Okay, Sarah. 
Yes, I do. I do. Um, I wanted to ask you, hello, first of all, everyone and, and you. Nice to see you. Good. Um, I wanted to ask you if you could say a little bit more about the Paramis and how they're um, clearing karma. I think this is really interesting. Let me see if I can get something for you. Wait a second. I have to see if I can find something for you. Um, yeah. Paramis are a list of 10. And if I can get into where I want to go, <laughs> hold on a second. I can, I can get them out for you. Um, just a second. Mm, makes sense. Mm. Wait a minute. Paramis to defeat the king. Yeah, I'll get this one out. I I put these together when I wrote them out and um I think I have to put this down here and now I can go into share and I can try and pull this up for you. I think, yeah, I can, okay. Okay, boy, that's miserably small, isn't it? <laughs> miserably small, okay. Um, I can maybe do it that way. Yeah. Okay. Um, what you have is you have 10 fetters and you have 10 paramis. It's like, talk, tell me about the precepts. And in order to teach you about the precepts, I maintain, I have to show you why they're important by teaching you the five hindrances, right? So I try to teach you the five precepts to try of hindrances. It's the same thing with the paramis. How can I expect you to remember these, okay? If I don't explain to you uh, why, they're important. And so the purpose of the paramis is to eliminate the fetters. So the fetters are the things that are holding you back. And the precepts are the ones, the, the one that is holding you, you can get this this way, right? Okay. Uh, and the precept, uh, I'm sorry, the par paramis are the ones that are going to help you that they, they form a firm foundation for spiritual progress and they help to create proper conditions for the experience of nibbana so they're another support system that we have in buddhism beyond the eightfold path okay they do develop differently in each individual according to their walk in life and they're also their past karma that comes through the past karma that comes into the person's life can affect keeping them from succeeding in completing the paramis they call. So you note that the paramis do not necessarily become fulfilled in a particular order either. That's another thing about this. So this list is a little different than the Eightfold Path because we can divide the Eightfold Path into wisdom, into, um, into the, uh, the Shila and the, the Panya, and also in the uh, Sati, the pr practice of the meditation. Okay, so your 10 perfections basically in the Theravada tradition are one is generosity, the second one is morality, the sila, the third one is renunciation. Okay, so you'll notice this is dana sila and the first bhavana that you practice. If you say that we should practice dana sila bhavana first, we would say generosity and morality, which are the precepts. And the renunciation is how we do that. We leave other things, let go of other things and renounce them. And they say the nikama, okay? The, then the next part is the panya, the insight, working, uh, developing insight. And that's your, your uh, practice of your meditation to discover the insights, which means discovering what the three um, characteristics actually mean and what do the Four Noble Truths, what do they mean? And that's, these are the imp most important insights. And then, um, then okay, uh, and then the Eightfold Path and the um, Dependent Origination. Your energy, Wiria, checking your energy that you put into your practice, 
checking whether the reason that you had sloth and torpor was you didn't have enough energy, raising the energy up for your observation, okay? Um, sharpening the way that you are observing everything. Patience, not getting up, stamping your feet and saying, I'm not sitting anymore, that's that. <laughs> You know, I've actually had people do that and said, no, come on, try one more time. You know, truthfulness is such a always practicing to tell the truth. And this truthfulness, I will tell you in the paramis has a lot to do with your teacher or guide when we are trying to coach you. Because if you lie to us about your truth, truth if it's not truthfulness in your interviews, it really messes things up. If we're trying to coach you at a level that you're really not at, and it just will frustrate you and you'll crash when you go home and get frustrated. It's not a good thing. So there is a lot of problem with that sometimes in particular countries that are very competitive nature with people that maybe two or three women are in the fourth John and they have lunch together and all of a sudden three more say, oh, I am too. <laughs> And then they pretend to be, but they're not. It's it's comical, but we don't we we have to catch it and stop that whole thing. Another one is resolution to have a resolution, Ahitana, okay? Um, ahitana, right. This is a resolution that you're going to keep doing the practice to get to reach nibbana and experience the opening, okay? And then do it again and do it again to go through the attainments. Okay, loving development of loving kindness is metta and equanimity is upekka. So these are 10 really important parts that need to be functioning. Now, see these parts that are, are these uh, 10 pieces, okay, are actually trying to help you to dissolve the mental fetters. So that, there, there's two sides to this thing. And the mental fetters, there are 10 of those too. So your 10 mental fetters or barriers that you have to overcome by keeping those paramis makes it so they will, you'll be able to get through these. One is self-illusion. This is atta, meaning taking things personally. You need to give that one up. Skeptical doubt, the doubt in how you are doing the practice. The third one is dependence on mere rules and rituals, believing that these rituals will take you to Nibbana. Now, this is a sensitive spot, number three. I want everybody to understand, it doesn't say here that you give up all celebrations and all ceremonies that take place in your community. You can still go to those, but you yourself understand that if you participate in these great big ritual ceremonies and everything, it's not for the purpose of reaching Nibbana. You know now because you have practiced and seen a practice that actually when you practice uh, the six R's, when you, you do it a few times, you realize there's something very different about this practice because when you see something, you, you recognize it, you um, release it, relax and smile and come back. And when you do that, you drop deeper and you see more things and you start to develop your mind where other people are not experiencing that in their practice. And some of them will say, some groups will say, we're not even going to close our eyes. We're going to sit on a chair and stare at the wall, all 20 of us. And they surround a room around the edge and they, they look at the wall, but they don't even close their eyes. Well, that's okay. But I asked them, why are they doing that? Because if you look inside, there's nothing there and you're just going to go to sleep. You see the difference? That means that they never read 111. They have no idea potentially of what's in there and what's occurring and what they could actually watch because they can't. And that that uh, with, with heavy concentration, you can't do that. Okay, ill will is you give up ill will, the abandoning of anger, hatred, and aversion. There's craving. Okay, I was gonna tell you these first three, one, two, and three, that's what happens with sodapana. Those are complete, they're gone, okay? And it's not that you totally and completely, we were very careful about, um, very careful about showing you the definition for self-illusion because it does not mean that you will never ever fall into atta again or take things personally. 
but it does mean that you completely under you do sincerely understand what self illusion is and you understand the difference between atta and anatta not taking things personally or taking things personally so that's the first level the second level you weaken um, ill will is the abandoning of anger hatred and aversion the fifth one is craving for sense pleasures the abandoning of lust greed and attachment and when you become sakadagami it firms up these three very very tight and then it it pr it pretty much you just don't have ill will like anger hatred and aversion coming up anymore and you don't have so much uh, desire for craving for sense pleasures like lust and greed and attachment you're not into it very much anymore and then the other down here you're getting into anagami okay uh, so five and six uh, four and five and then craving for divine existence in the brahma lokas of subtle form what is that one abandonment you have to abandon the craving for mental material rupa jhanas and the craving for divine existence in the immaterial brahmaloka abandon the craving for the immaterial arupa jhanas okay the mental jhanas that's because there's a group of people that exist uh, in some places you'll find people that really sit in meditation for the express purpose of experiencing bliss it's like a drug it's like a shot you know a shot in my head and I'm going to have bliss tonight. And we do it for escape from the world. And I've even talked with some people who believe the bliss is the Nibbana and that's all they want. So this is a lot of desire, isn't it? So that's a little off sides. So this, then the next one is craving for divine existence in Im immaterial Brahma Lokas um abandonment of the craving for the immaterial arupa jhanas oh sit there. okay i did rupa and arupa the, these last three to go are conceit abandoning the craving and pridefulness of your practice where you are uh, letting go of anything like that because it gets in your way and restlessness is really with us restlessness um, stays with you until at the very, very end. Um, restlessness is abandonment of restlessness due to guilt and remorse. Restlessness, guilt, and remorse are like triplets. They stick together, see. Um, ignorance is being reduced from the day that you come and see me and I start to explain stuff to you, <laughs> you know, and as you learn it and test it and you know it's real, you're reducing it, reducing it, reducing it. But what this is talking about reduction and finishing off of ignorance. I don't know if I put it on here. No, I didn't. It's this sentence, the remainderless, listen carefully, the remainderless fading away and cessation of ignorance, okay, is the end of this whole mass of suffering. So remainderless fading away. So it fades away and you feel like it's not there at all but there's no remainder to it at all. There's no remainder in you at all for it to come up again in a month or two or three or anything. It's just completely gone. Remainderless fading away and cessation of ignorance. And that's where you just won't come up again. So this is something that I was giving out to people to understand the paramis and perfections. Anybody who wants me to send them a copy of this, they can. Uh, write me, um, you know, you can, it, whoops, right, they can write me, um, right, just write me, doot, 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 there, to um, this one, Kanti Kama, Kanti Kama, two, at, gmail.com if you want a copy of the paramis and the fetters i can send you that one yeah so does that clear that up for you and if you have that if i send that paper to you um when i send that paper to you 
you get a little bit more detail on each one of those links when you read it. It's like a little paragraph for each one of them that I had to do for Bonte. Yeah. Yeah, thank you. That's really helpful. Um, I also wanted to know, um, like how those, how you're saying those connect. So you're practicing at the, the purification, the cleaning right now in the, in the practice and when things come up in your daily life, how does it work as a, as a backwards cleansing, picking up and addressing old karma? You don't get involved in it. Now, this is the part where you don't want to, this is the order of the Buddha. His direct order to his monks is don't be sitting around in this camp discussing karma. <laughs> He'll tell them that, you know. He has this one sutta. I thought this was the one it was in, but it wasn't in this one. He has this one thing where it comes down on him really hard because you can't get a straight answer perfectly of how this works and what it is. The only way that you can go deeper into understanding what this is, is to experience it by going deep in your meditation getting very firm and then sometimes rolling time backwards and going through some past lives and you begin to understand or you have something come up in your life that you just i don't know you you go until you're usually it's over 30 years old i haven't seen anybody well i don't know it could be any time because it happens to young kids sometimes they recall stuff and they're only five or six years old but for adults um, only people that have ever come to me about this are like always in their late 30s, between 30s and 50s, you know, and they come with me. What happened was the fear of heights, and that was at 51 years old. So for 50 years, I was not afraid of heights at all in any way. No way. I would climb up a tree 40 feet and build a, a tree stand and sit up there, you know. I didn't have any fear of heights, and then that came. So, so the thing is that you can discover these things that happen in your life and they just aren't connected. You start having a habitual tendency for fear of something, a phobia like that, or a phobia of water, or a phobia of driving. You just can't drive anymore. Suddenly, you're just terrified to drive in a forest or on a highway. You can go down one road, but not on the highway anymore. And you used to all the time. That was another one that happened that I helped um, somebody with. Where does this come from? And this is fragmented karma, uh, karma pala, fruit of karma that's coming out in your life. And it can be fear of the dark suddenly, but you never were as a child before. And then in your midlife, all of a sudden there's a crisis, you see? And this can be triggered the same way as what we call re-stimulation. Um, re-stimulation is where it's like PTSD. Uh, you know, in PTSD, you can get triggered from a past event, traumatic event experience, or something that happened in the past, simply by one of your sense doors. You can see something smell something, taste something that someone gives you and get set off and get really frightened. Or you can smell a particular odor that somebody's burning and it sets you off and you really get scared or hear something, or you can just touch something. It can be a color from seeing something or a te what do you say, texture of a, you can show up with a knitted, a knit uh, tweed dress, like, you know, a tweed dress. And it has a rough texture and I could touch it and go off, you know, because whatever the event was, I was wearing it or someone else was wearing it and something happened. But it, you can't remember anything in this life. This is how karma comes through from other places. We don't so that know how that the, 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 the purification through the Paramis would have an impact then in the present because you're, you're purifying yourself right here and now. Yeah. So that when a re-stimulation um, occurrence might, might happen, you're more transparent. And so That's it right. Yeah. Okay. They may, they, yeah. Now, now, if we go back to that list, if we went back to the Paramis, I don't know if I left it there or not. I was going to show you, I was looking at it. Yeah, it's still there. 
Okay, I was looking at this uh, one day when I was teaching somebody and I said, you know, when we look at this, we taught you generosity and we taught you the, the Sheila before you started your practice of, uh, of twim, okay? And we explained the, uh, the Nekama Parami to you where we explained that you're giving up certain things you're changing and staying with the precepts. That's a form of renunciation, okay? Then perfection of wisdom, we say wisdom means dependent origination. So we're teaching you the core piece of wisdom and the wisdom, he became aware of the wisdom parami, perfection of wisdom. He reminded himself just as a monk on his alms round collects alms from every house without making any distinction even so must you gather knowledge and wisdom from every source, regardless of the status of the person you learn from, so that you might find like a hobo, okay, who was riding on trains and living off the land. And he's just a hobo, but you might get in a conversation with him and really learn something from him. People have remarkable wisdom. I mean, I was working in a place, uh, giving food in Washington, DC, one time in a, a program that's called Some, So Others May Eat, Some it's called, Catholic organization. And these people came in off the street to get food. And some of them, when I talked to some of them and I was you know, playing the piano and they were singing and we got some of them listening to music, you'd start talking to them, having a cup of coffee with them after lunch if you want to stay and you're in there, these guys have PhDs and they're on the street and they're living on benches. You don't know who anybody is anymore in this day and time. And you don't know where you will get wisdom from. I had a tremendous amount of wisdom I learned and how to survive uh, for about three years from the Native American tribe that I was working with in Virginia just tremendous amount of things to learn from them for very basic survival skills about rebalancing the mind and stuff. Another one is perfection of your energy. You learn this and patience and truthfulness have a bearing on your practice when you're working to learn your practice. Resoluteness is you're determined to keep going just as the mountain, despite of the fierce winds blowing in all directions, remains immovable and is never shaken, even so must you fulfill the perfection of resoluteness and not move at all in your practice. You don't move. You learn that early in the beginning of your training. And your unconditional love, of course, and your equanimity comes through because you're practicing the Brahma Viharas. So when you go toward the objective of Nibbana through the Brahma Vihara training, you in, it engulfs you, you engulf the paramis and you're working on them all the time when you are practicing twim, all the time, okay? The six steps are, you can take the six steps yourself and write them down to recognize, release, relax, re-smile, return, and repeat. Look at your paramis and draw lines to them to, to see what part of your practice is applying toward, toward the parami. Okay. okay, anybody else? Hey, I have a question. Yeah. Uh, what can you tell me about shunyata emptiness in terms of in terms of practice, sitting practice and daily activity practice. Okay, shunyata. Okay, first of all, um, the this is one of the slippages that happened in modern day interpretation of um, of Buddhism, the Buddha Dhamma, in looking at shunyata. And shunyata was adopted by very heavily by some of the Mahayana tradition, but also you had, um, can't remember his name now. Um, but the when we go back in the texts in Majima Nikaya, you go to Majima Nikaya number 121 and Majima Nikaya number 122. 
and you have the Chula Shunyata Sutta, the shorter discourse on voidness, and you have the greater discourse, the Maha Shunyata Sutta, the greater discourse on voidness. And in these two suttas, you find out what the Buddha actually meant by shunyata or voidness, okay? And it isn't what you think it is at all. And that's what was a shock to me because I knew many people who were devoted to the emptiness school, but they were hunting for something where there was absolutely nothing <laughs> and getting to this state of floating, like you were on strings in the universe in the dark and you're just hanging there and there's just nothing, 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 see? That isn't what it was about at all. It's very funny. So in, in 121, if you go there, um, if you write me a note and ask me to send you these two suttas, I, I can, I have copies of them in my computer. I can send them to you and you can read them, but I encourage you to be very careful of the last uh, two paragraphs of 121, because that's where it reveals what the Buddha meant by voidness. And the way it goes, I'll, I'll run you through it a little bit so you can kind of get a feel for what happened. Ananda came to the Buddha and he was talking to him and he says, he asked the Buddha, Lord, um, uh, he says, uh, Venerable Sir, on one occasion you, uh, you were living in the Sakyan country where there was a town of the Sakyans named uh, Nagaraka. And um, I heard and I learned this from your own lips. And I and you that you you have said to me now, Ananda, I often abide in voidness. Did I hear that correctly, venerable sir? Did I learn that correctly? Attend to it correctly and remember it correctly. So Ananda is the one that's preserving everything the Buddha says, and he has this, um, you know, Xerox machine in his head. <laughs> and he just whatever he hears, he. He remembers it word for word. And I've met people like this connected with the military because I can tell you, I can tell you for real, they really do exist. There are people like that. But anyway, um, and then proceeds this sutta. Certainly, Ananda, you heard that correctly, learned it correctly, attended to that correctly, and remembered it as formally. Uh, so now also do I abide in voidness. And then he tells this whole story about voidness. And I almost want to save this for Saturday and do it for you on Saturday. No, we, Saturday we turned into a sitting one. I don't know, what time is it? Bunty, what time is it? <laughs> yeah, what time? It's 8.30. It's 8.30? Yeah. Okay, okay. Well, I don't want to go into it, but basically the secret behind this thing comes in the end of the sutra and you have to read the sutta to understand how he gets here. But he says, um, thus he regards it as void of what is not there, but as to what remains there, he understands that which is present thus. This is present. And this, when you get to the end of the sutta and he says that, you realize there's no such thing as nothing. There is no such thing as this shunyata that everybody tries so hard to get to. Now, you actually, when you are practicing um, TWIM, you have the, the steps of uh, recognizing that your, your attention has moved and you're holding on to something. So you let go of it, you relax, and then smile and come back between the relax step and smile, come back. There is what we call a still point or pure mind point. And what is that? The pure mind point is void, just a void sitting there. And there is no craving in it at all. So once we understand the relationship between the school of emptiness and what the Buddha said in this sutta and in the next one, and we think about this practice to, rec to release it, relax, 
smile and come back. That spot between the release step or the relaxed step and the smile, there's no craving. It's, it's a tiny, tiny, tiny spot like the head of a straight pin. It's that big, it's so tiny, but it is a cessation. And it proves to you, if you are very quiet and you watch that spot, all of a sudden it's a shock because you realize there is such a state as a cessation of craving. Up till you see that for yourself, you don't believe it. You don't believe there's really such a thing as cessation. You see? So to see Niroda, that's a Niroda point. And we say pure mind, which is what the shunyata is talking about. The shunyata is really aiming at no craving or clinging at all. The total, complete quiet mind. So if you're just watching inside, but in order to get to it, you have to learn, number one, how do hindrances work? Number two, how do we manage them? So there's no stress or no struggle or no pressure on us at all. How do we do that? And you have to recognize that there really is such a state as nothingness, you see? absolute emptiness, which is what Shunyata is. But he's pointing out in these two suttas, it didn't mean emptiness. That was Nargajuna who started that. Nargajuna is the one that started this school on emptiness. And Nargajuna should not be criticized any more than Buddha Gosa should be criticized because both of those people, according to Professor Karuna Dasa in Hong Kong University, okay, he points out both of them were trying very hard to hold people in the Buddhism and bring more people to the Buddhism by explaining what it was. And they tried very hard to make it so that it wasn't so complex. It's basically simply this is what it is. So when I think of emptiness, it say shunyata means emptiness. At that point that I say that, it is emptiness. That is what Nibbana is, isn't it? Beyond neither perception or non-perception, absolutely cessation, right? So it's the same thing. It turns out to mean the same thing. And he's saying, Buddha is saying in these two suttas, if you go from the city to the country, you are void of the city. And now you're in the country. If you hear the sound of the town and the people, but now you go to the forest, now you are void of the city and void of the town and void of the people's noise, right? And when you get to the forest, you have the sound of the forest. When you let that go, you just have the jhana start happening. So what do you see telling you? Void means I am void of this and void of that and void of that and here I am. So in the end of the scent thing when he goes through all the jhanas to all the way to uh, to um, cessation at the end he says in regards it is uh, he regards this state that he's reached as void of what is not there, but as to what remains there, he understands that which is present thus, this is present. And at the time that Bhante told us this the first time, um, was at the time uh, that um, the university up in print, not Princeton, but around Harvard, MIT, had decided that there is no such thing as a vacuum in space. Ah, and I grew up believing there was a vacuum in space. And they decide now there is no such a thing as a vacuum in space. And you say, well, what's there? <laughs> and they say, it's like in something that's something, and they go something that is and has intelligence. And I'm going, wow but we don't know what. So is that where universal consciousness is, is a question. <laughs> you need to tell me next week, okay. Is that where universal consciousness is? Intelligent goo, 
in the universe or intelligence that's in the empty what we thought was empty is not empty is what they're saying void of this so whatever when we're void of everything now we're void we're void of a vacuum then this is present that's it <laughs> okay okay anybody else have a question okay i know you'll think of a question this week i hope i answered this enough for you you just remember karma is your intention and you be careful of your intention when you do anything. And every day when you do your karma tomorrow, you do it every day. You can't say karma is running your life. It's not because you have a karma is just action that happens someplace else. And now you're here. And every once in a while, you realize the fruit of some karma. You're in a ridiculously bad situation. You have no idea how you got there. Probably that's something to do with karma, but don't try to figure it out. That just keeps hitting. Okay. <laughs> okay. Let's say our prayer. Okay. May suffering ones be suffering free and the fear struck fearless be. May the grieving shed all grief and may all beings find relief. May all beings share this merit that we have thus acquired for the acquisition of all kinds of happiness. May beings inhabiting space and earth, devas and nagas of mighty power, share this merit of ours. May they long protect the Buddha's dispensation. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu.